to say, by the way, that I'm really jealous of what you guys are here because this show is being far better run than I ever did it. What I did it was like 40 minutes of flop sweat and checking my watch and making sure I wasn't like going to get charged by the venue for going over time. <sighs> Hate you all. Anyway, next up is Amy Temple Harper, who, according to this bio, and because it's in the bio, it is official and true. She is an amazing writer and performer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome up to the stage, Amy Temple Harper. to uh, see his, there's a museum in Richmond, and I, I was pretty unemployed at the time, so my full-time job was loving Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> <laughs> this story I wrote for, um, for, in the style of Edgar Allan Poe, but um, for my family, and for my brother Gene, especially. Is he here? God, I hope not. <laughs> It's called The Lustrous Heart. <clears throat> Heart. Jean's father was an ichthyologist. If you don't know what that is, then go look it up. <laughs> Jean knew it meant fish biologist because that is what his father was. Jean's father collected specimens. Among his father's great collection was a walking catfish preserved in formaldehyde in a gallon pickle jar. When his father came driving home one day, he had a tank in the back of his pickup. Hey kids, I have something special to show you. He lifted the lid off the tank and out jumped a catfish. It slithered to the ground and then commenced, commenced to run down Grant Street and Jean's father ran after it. When he finally caught up to it on the corner of Grant and Water Street, it was not long for this world. His father also owned other strange things. Are my boobs showing? <laughs> he, he owned a dried specimen called a spiny blowfish that Jean and his brother Stuart were not allowed to touch. When their father was at work, Jean and his brother would go into their father's office and pick up the blowfish and look at its dried out eyes. One time they picked it up, just to touch it, just to feel the spines. Then they put it back carefully. One time they did more than just pick it up. One time they decided to play catch with it. They threw it back and forth like a hot potato until they were giggling so much that their eye-hand coordination faltered. The spiny blowfish fell to the ground with a small thud, and it made the sound that a baby's rattle might make. They stopped giggling and looked at each other. Then they solemnly put the spiny blowfish on the shelf and left the office. Their father also owned a shark vertebrae, several stuffed specimens of birds, and a, and a hunting rifle. 
These things were all stored in the office of their father, except for the rifle. It was stored with a shotgun in the closet of the office. No one had ever told them not to touch the guns, but Gene and his brother, Stuart, both knew not to touch them. They weren't stupid children. <laughs> when Gene was 10 years old, his father was going to take him hunting. Gene and Stuart both begged to go, but his mother said, Harry, if you take those boys hunting at this age, you'll mess up their minds. <laughs> How else will they learn the ways of the world? His father asked. All right, Jean can go, but Stuart can't because he's too little. Stuart was eight years old and put up a big fuss. He was so upset that when no one was looking, he kicked Jean hard in the stomach. So Jean was taken hunting. He had a difficult time keeping up pace and started to get cold and tired. That is when they saw the most beautiful deer. Jean's father froze and Jean froze by instinct when he saw the deer freeze. Very slowly, his father raised his gun and took aim, then quickly shot the deer. The noise was deafening in Jean's ears, but the explosion felt like it came from somewhere far away. The explosion seemed to continue when he saw the deer fall. It lay there flailing and tried to stand up. Then his father quickly ran over to the deer and shot it again in the heart. The deer hung in the garage for some time. Gene and his brother Stuart devised a game called Pushover, and this is how it was played. Each brother would stand on the side of the deer, which was hanging by the garage, and they would push it. And if the other person fell down, that person got a point. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have any toys. <laughs> um, they would stand in the center or they stand in circle like prize fighters ready to box, but instead of boxing, they shove the deer towards each other. It was a simple game, but lots of fun. When it came time to butcher the deer, Jean and Stuart weren't allowed to watch. Their mother put her foot down. Absolutely not, Harry. I won't have it. It's just too gruesome for young boys. But Florence, it would be like a biology lesson. No, Harry, absolutely not. And then the boys weren't allowed to watch because everyone knew who wore the pants in the family. After the butchering was done, Jean's father handed him something. It was heavy. It gleamed. It was the bullet from the gun. Here, son, this you can keep to remember our trip. Very soon after, another jar appeared in the office on the shelf. It was a heart in a pickle jar. It had some kind of hole in it. Well, not a hole, really. But a part of the heart looked like it had been gouged or ripped slightly. It shone with a luster that Jean could look at for hours. That heart was once inside a living being, thought Jean. Jean was especially proud of this new acquisition. He had had a hand in it, after all. They spent that winter eating venison jerky, venison stew, venison roast, and even venison sausage. Jean and Stuart had taken to practicing hunting. They used big sticks they found behind their house for rifles. After school, he and his brother would stalk each other around the house. When they would find each other, they would yell, BAM! I got you in the eye! Or, BAM! I got you in the heart. They carefully kept track of how many kills they each got. It was great fun. One day, when their father was not home, they went into the office and Jean picked up the rifle from the closet. He raised it to his shoulder and pulled the trigger and yelled, BAM! I got you! His mother came running. Call 911, she screeched. She had Stuart in her arms and was kissing his head and face. Jean froze. Don't just stand there, call 911, screamed his mother. Still, Jean couldn't move. She leapt up and grabbed the phone and called 911. My boy's been shot, she yelled into the phone. 109 Grant Street, Florence Harrison. She left the phone off the hook and ran back to Stuart. Stuart had an odd, lustrous look in his eyes. He almost seemed to be smiling. Jean grabbed his hands and held them tightly. I was just kidding, Stuart. You know, just kidding. Then there was the funeral. Jean wasn't allowed to attend. Everyone in Silvertown knew that Jean had shot his brother. Everyone knew it was an accident. But Jean's parents felt that someone might say something hurtful or inappropriate to Jean. 
so Jean didn't get a chance to say goodbye to Stuart. About a month later, another specimen appeared on the shelf. It looked like the deer heart, but it was a little smaller. It was red and very pretty. The original deer heart was brown and it had a hole in it, but this new heart was preserved so well that it retained a very lustrous red color and it was shining. There was not a hole in it, not even a blemish. It was smooth and perfect. Mm. Oh,